Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 432nd episode, we have a bunch of news, including that Microraptor had feet like a modern hawk. Sabrina's going to tell me all about that Mm -hmm. because I know nothing else. We also have two updates on the Allosaurus scavenger hypothesis. There's a reaction to the original paper. Then we have the original authors coming back with their reaction to the reaction. So it's a whole little bit of drama, maybe. Science in action. It's very exciting. I really enjoy that hypothesis. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Duria Venator, or Duria Venator, depending on your preference. And we have a Dinosaur Connection Challenge of Hockey, which Sabrina is going to do. But before we get into all of that, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep our podcast running. And this week, we'd like to thank Gabe, Myco Raptor, Miriam, and Kylo Solis, Brooke, T-Bear, Bradley, Witch Lars, Tarkia Tamer, and Dino Mo. Thank you so much for being a Dino at all and joining our community. We appreciate you, and we're happy to have you on board. Jumping into the news. As Garrett mentioned, we got an item about Microraptor, but it's not just about Microraptor. It's about bird feet and what bird feet can tell us about dinosaur lifestyles. For a second, I thought you said Mycoraptor, our patron. Oh. <laughs> I was like, there's a paper about Mycoraptor. <laughs> like, oh, Plus, <laughs> Microraptor. <laughs> that, that I just mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> so this paper was published by Michael Pittman and others, and it's in Nature Communications as open access if anybody wants to dive in and get all the nitty gritty details. I'm assuming uh, since it was Michael Pittman, it was easy to read since he's a very good science communicator. Yeah, there was a lot to digest though. There's, this paper goes over a lot. Really interesting stuff though. So birds, their feet are very different depending on their lifestyle. And we have talked about differences in bird feet before we I think it's pretty obvious, like a duck foot is different from a hawk foot. <laughs> yes. And it, the lifestyle, you know, the way the foot is, it can change depending on if the bird's spending most of the time running or walking on the ground or if they hunt in the air, as examples. Oh, hunt in the air mean like midair? Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. So some of the differences in bird feet, you can see in the toe pads, the foot scales, the claw shape, and foot joints. Perching and ground-dwelling birds, as well as non-predatory birds that use their feet to move food, think parrots, they tend to have more flattened toe pads. And birds that use their feet for hunting have more curved toe pads. And toe pads are basically the bottom of the foot, like the fleshy part they walk on, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I think it's scaly, too. Now, modern raptor feet, they also have these reticulate scales that They're in like a net-like pattern and they're sharp. They're called spicules to help them grip prey. So basically they have spiky scales on the bottom of their feet. That's crazy. It's almost, it makes me think of like a crampon, like an ice (laughs) climber, like spikes on the bottom of the feet. But it's like if you were using crampons to grab food, like with little spears on your feet. Yeah. It seems crazy, but I guess since birds are flying, they don't wear down these scales to nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And they come in very handy. Now, as a side note, osprey, which eat fish, they tend to have really sharp spikes. Toucans, though, they're only somewhat sharpened. And I think it's because they use their feet to manipulate or move food around. Not for toucans don't hunt, right? Yeah, they're just moving food around. So they're just using it as like extra grip. Yeah. Now, modern raptors tend to have more curved claws, if you think of owls as an example. And other types of birds have claws that aren't very curved, unless they're a perching bird. For extra grip on a branch. Exactly. Strong foot joints can help with grip force, too. And we see this in modern birds of prey and euodromaeosaur and dromaeosaurids. It helps when you're hunting large, struggling prey. Whereas you see weak foot joints in birds like ratites and emu and in ornithomimosaurians, birds that run more. That's interesting because I would think that things that are running fast would want strong foot joints no matter what because Mm -hmm. it it seems like you need strong feet if you're running fast. But I guess you would just need the strong legs. The joints of the foot are only important for grabbing. Yeah. And if you got prey that's fighting back and thrashing, you need strong (laughs) joints to withstand it. 
For this study, the authors examined Ambroteryx, Anchiornis, Archaeopteryx, Confuciusornis, Fortunguavus, Microraptor, Sapiornis, and Yanornis. I think sometimes that's pronounced Fortunguavus also. Oh, thank you. So it's eight different animals here. The authors wanted to better understand early theropod flyers and their ecological roles and how that changed as flight developed. So you've got a range in time with these animals. Yeah, and pretty different bird likeness too, because something like Archaeopteryx is like, yeah, it could probably fly, maybe okay. And Microraptor is like, eh, could it even fly? It's sort of four winged. And then you've got things like Confucius Ornus, which is practically a bird. Yeah. Ambroteryx could only glide. Yeah. They chose these animals because they are, quote, the closest fossil relatives of modern birds and have feet that share morphological and functional similarities with modern birds, end quote. It's all about the feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And they decided not to compare the feet with modern crocodile feet because those feet are often webbed and specialized to be semi-aquatic. Going back to, you know, closest relatives are crocodiles and birds, but in this case, we're just comparing birds. By this point with this group, crocodiles are not a very relevant comparison, in other words. Yeah. <laughs> they imaged the fossils using laser-stimulated fluorescence, LSF. They studied over a thousand theropod fossils from the Shandong Tianyu Museum of Nature in Shandong Province, China. As an example, they looked at over 500 specimens of Confucius Ornus, <sighs> but they only found two specimens with good soft tissues in the feet, so only two specimens made it further into the study. That's so crazy. I didn't know they had 500 specimens of Confucius Ornus. I knew they had hundreds of specimens of multiple of these like feathered mm -hmm. dinosaurs, but that's just crazy. It's cool that they even have soft tissues of two because they, uh, most of the time we just have one yeah. specimen of a species with soft tissue. So that's great. Of the thousand fossils that they sampled, only 12 specimens had toe pads, foot scales, and claws that were either partially or completely preserved. And when you break it down, that belongs to Anchiornis, Confucius Ornus, Sabiornis, Yanornis, and Microraptor. So that's five of the eight animals in the study. They also decided to study the Archaeopteryx specimens from Berlin, Germany, and Thermopolis, Wyoming, because they're the earliest avian flyers though there's no soft tissues in the feet. Oh, yeah. That would have been big news if they found toe pads on Archaeopteryx. Yeah. <laughs> and then they studied papers and photos of Ampoteryx and Fortunguavis specimens, but those also didn't have soft tissues in the feet. And they chose Ampoteryx because it's a non-Paravian theropod flyer. It's a glider, not a flyer. And they chose Fortunguavis because it's an, an anti-ornithine. So they took all these fossils and they compared them to modern birds. Potentially, the biggest find here is that Microraptor had a lot of features in common with modern raptors, even though Microraptor is not a bird. So Microraptor had spiky scales, it had strong foot joints to help it grasp, and the soft tissue in the feet and the claws, along with the fact that one specimen of Microraptor was found with bird gut contents, and that Microraptor could potentially flap to fly suggests that it may have been able to, quote, hunt flying and difficult to hold prey, end quote, potentially going after theropods or small pterosaurs or gliding mammals. And maybe it could hunt in the air. Hmm. That's a bold claim. Yeah. Unless it was like a toucan, although I guess it wouldn't have the strong foot joints in that case. No, yeah, it's a number of factors there that make it like a hawk. Microraptor also had an enlarged second toe, which maybe it used to pin prey like Deinonychus did. However, its first toe is the smallest one, and it couldn't work with the second toe in a way to grip the prey. So instead, Microraptor may have used its body weight to help grip the prey with its large second toe. Even though Microraptor wasn't a bird, it seemed to have a more specialized raptorial lifestyle, and this could help show that non-birds that flew had specialized roles that are filled by birds today. Though we still don't know exactly how well Microraptor could fly, but it is possible that it could at least occasionally snatch something in the air. Yeah, even if it's gliding, 
it might be able to glide into something. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing some paleo art of, I think, Ichi or something gliding and snatching at like a fly or something, like a big insect. Yeah, that sounds familiar. So it's cool to think about. And that the fact that you can figure out this kind of behavior from feet. Mm -hmm. So for the other animals in the study, Amboteryx, as I mentioned, was a glider. It had foot claws that weren't really curved, so that helps to show that it was probably a ground dweller, although it could climb up using its forelimbs. Anchiornis and Archaeopteryx were probably also ground dwellers. Oh, interesting. That reminds me of the recent paper where they were saying maybe Archaeopteryx, maybe it wasn't a paper, somebody was saying Archaeopteryx might have been secondarily flightless, mm. like an ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> and that maybe, you know, flight evolved even earlier and that Archaeopteryx was a non-flying descendant because if it's a ground dweller, that would sort of fit with that. It does. And then Confucius Ornus seemed to have been an ecological generalist. Sabiornis may have been a, quote, ecologically complex herbivorous thermal soarer, that's where you use warmer air that rises to help stay in the air, that supplemented its diet with meat, end quote. I guess that's what makes it complex. And that's based on its ability to grasp, and it had claws that are like perching birds, which is interesting because modern thermal soarers are mostly carnivores, but Sapiornis has these herbivorous and carnivorous traits. Yeah, that is very interesting. And Fortune Guavis seems to have had a perching lifestyle. Like a little songbird. <laughs> and last, Yanornis probably didn't have great grasping capabilities, and it had relatively straight claws, so it was probably a ground dweller. There's also specimens that have been found of Yanornis that had with evidence that it ate fish. Hmm. Sort of like the osprey. Yeah, but it had relatively straight claws, so a little bit different. Oh, yeah. The paper ends with, quote, generalists typically survive over specialists in times of ecosystem crisis. Our results reveal early specialist non-avialin and avialin flyers that would be more susceptible to extinction during such crises. This should be taken into account as we work to better understand the turnover of theropod flyers and the rise of modern birds, end quote. So a lot of this paper was about figuring out where these theropods fit in and yeah, the niches that they filled and their roles. Yeah, I was thinking that when you were talking about the complexity of that herbivorous soaring one, was that Sapiornis? Mm -hmm. How, yeah, it's a generalist. And now it seems like every bird is hyper specialized because mm. there's like 10,000 species of birds on earth. And some of them, you know, like they're fly catching birds that all they do basically is catch flies. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas back then in the very beginning of the bird family tree, maybe there were birds that were omnivorous and had traits that we would think are crazy because it's like, how could you have this combination of it was eating plants, but it's soaring like a vulture and like <laughs> all these different things that you wouldn't expect to be combined. But in the early days, yeah, the generalist is what you want to be. Mm-hmm. And maybe even across that KPG boundary or something, or one of the other extinction events in the Mesozoic could be useful to be a generalist too. I don't know that Sapiornis counts as a generalist since it's more on the herbivorous side. Oh, true. Yeah. yeah. So there might be other better examples. Well, Confucius Ornus seems to have been a generalist. The other ones, it was a little less like that. Gotcha. But yeah, all that from bird feet. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of bird feet, this isn't really related, but we have our Allosaurus as a scavenger update. In that Allosaurus is related to birds and so it has bird-like feet that way? It did. <laughs> and I was also thinking a lot of these debates about whether or not something is a scavenger relates to how much ground they cover, mm. how much footwork they're getting done walking around. Anyway, I'm just going to get into it. So we have an update on this Allosaurus as a scavenger. There are two new responses to the controversial paper, but again, one of them is by Adam Kane et al. That's a response to the original authors, and then the original authors came back with a response to the response. So both of them are published in the Ecological Modeling Journal, just like the original paper was. We first talked about this paper way back in episode 353. Oh, that was a while ago. It's like a year and a half ago. 
We interviewed the author, Cameron Paul, in episode 357, the, after being a little bit harsh about the paper. Mm. And then they messaged us like, hey, I want to come on and talk about this. Yeah. And we were happy to have them on. It was a good interview. It was. And if you're a patron and you haven't checked out the extended version of that interview, I'd highly recommend it. It's about an hour long and goes into a lot of detail in his thought process and model and basically not necessarily what all is in the paper, but sort of why they were going through this and why they think it's likely that there was a big scavenger in the Morrison formation. But as a quick recap, in episode 353, we're talking about Paul and Ruedas, who built a computer model to see if Allosaurus could have survived exclusively as a scavenger. And I think the title of the paper basically was like the same level as a vulture today. The claims of the paper, I think it's useful to go through them because obviously the claims are being contested. Mm -hmm. But one of the first big claim is that there's a lot of evidence against Allosaurus being a predator, meaning something that's attacking living animals. So they said Allosaurus had a relatively weak bite force. It also had bad binocular vision, poor hearing, and was relatively slow, not cursorial, as we sometimes say. Mm -hmm. They also presented some evidence for it being good at scavenging. Maybe the biggest one is that it had a very good sense of smell, but they also said it could bite and rip quickly, which is similar to modern scavengers. It could also swallow a lot of meat in one gulp, and it had head ornamentation on its skull that might scare off prey. Well, it's busy taking those large bites. Yeah. <laughs> so those points weren't actually tested in the paper. It was actually all about a scavenging model. It's sort of just a background as to why they think Allosaurus may have been a scavenger. They reused a model that was originally used to test wolves preying on sheep. And basically in the model, you have a bunch of wolves wandering around, you have a bunch of sheep wandering around, and then when they run into each other, there's a certain probability that the wolf kills the sheep. There's a certain probability that the sheep gets away. And then in this model, they have the certain probability that the sheep kills the wolf. It doesn't really make sense there, but it makes sense mm. <laughs> with Allosaurus and a sauropod. Yeah. So... Basically, they're testing whether or not Allosaurus would find enough meat to be a scavenger or if it would be better off trying to be a predator. Some of the details of the model that I think are the most important is that the Morris Formation had a lot of sauropods and they died at some point. And mm -hmm. when they did, a ton of meat would have been suddenly available for scavenging. Not just a ton, maybe up to Multiple 45 tons. tons. Yeah. <laughs> The original paper said something like a Brachiosaurus might weigh like 45 tons. So that is a lot of meat. That's an insane amount of meat. A African elephant, a male African elephant, which is the biggest land vertebrate now, weighs about seven tons. So this is like almost seven times as big. 30% hmm. of the sauropod population were adults in the model. So they, they were large. Yeah. So there were a lot of large ones. And sauropod carcasses in the model would last for months, possibly up to six years. And that was based on pig carcasses in a different study. They said that Allosaurus was going to survive on about 11 kilograms of meat a day if it was ectothermic. I think it might have risen up to a maximum of 28 or so mm. kilograms if it was really endothermic and needed a really high metabolism. They also said that Allosaurus could detect a carcass from one to 10 kilometers away partly based on things like humans can smell a rotting whale from about six kilometers away. And a predatory Allosaurus that attacked a sauropod in their model, being a predator, would kill it 35% of the time and it would be killed by the sauropod 10% of the time. Good for the sauropod. <laughs> yeah. With the remainder 55% of the time being the sauropod basically just escapes or the Allosaurus gives up. And they also had, for predatory Allosaurus, they would only attack sauropods, which were under three tons in weight. Hmm. So that was sort of the original paper in a nutshell. And at the end of the result, they said the model showed that the predatory Allosaurus didn't do so hot and the scavenging Allosaurus did great. And therefore, we think Allosaurus would have been a scavenger. So Brian Eng quickly responded to this on Twitter saying that Allosaurus didn't really have weak jaws. Their jaws were about as strong as a wolf or a leopard. 
And there are also several relatively large bones that have been bitten through by Allosaurus. Mm. Tom Holtz also refuted the binocular vision claim, saying that not actually refuting specifically that Allosaurus had good binocular vision, but instead that it isn't necessary to be a predator because essentially most non-Tyrannosaurids had bad binocular vision. Mm. And lots of living predators have bad binocular vision, including Komodo dragons, crocodiles, snakes, sharks, and whales. And that's our regular reminder that all whales are predators. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you don't necessarily need great sight to be a predator. But we didn't have a peer-reviewed response or much of any response at all about the actual model that showed scavenging. That was really the crux of the original paper mm -hmm. was with all these sauropods and all these allosaurs, right. how could they have what scavenged? What happens to all that meat? Exactly. But now we have that response. Yes, by Kane et al., and they, in broad strokes, disagree that Allosaurus was a scavenger. Okay. I guess I could have guessed that because there's a counter paper. <laughs> yeah. They probably wouldn't have bothered countering it if it was in agreement with their paper. For fossil evidence, they said that there's a Stegosaurus plate with an Allosaurus bite mark in it. Awfully conspicuous. Mm. There's also an adult Allosaurus hip bone with a stab wound, which matches a Stegosaurus tail spike. Ouch. And it seems to have gotten infected and eventually killed the Allosaurus. Ooh, that's a plus one for the Stegosaurus. It is. And they also said 15% of the specimens in the Morrison formation were unarmored ornithischians that were much smaller than sauropods, and therefore Allosaurus could have preyed on them rather than relying on sauropods and thus wouldn't have had to if sauropods were really deadly, mm. go after these sauropods, they could have gone after easier prey. Right. In terms of the model, they also came up with quite a few things they disagree with. They consider the 10% death rate per attack on the sauropod way too high. Mm. And that was sort of when I was reviewing their claims, the one that stood out the most to me too. Because if you think about it, this model is equivalent to rolling a 10-sided die. And if you roll a one, the Allosaurus dies. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you have to roll the die every time an Allosaurus attempts a hunt. So at that rate, an Allosaurus would only have about a 12% chance of surviving 20 attacks. Mm. And after 100 attacks, only about 1 in 40,000 Allosaurus would survive. Just as a quick side note, because we've been talking about pathologies lately, and there are a lot of Allosaurus specimens with injuries. <laughs> yes, so depending on how you look at that, you could look at it as, well, Allosaurus was attacking things and they were getting injured in the process. Or you could look at it as, well, Allosaurus was getting injured doing whatever in its day-to-day -day life. Mm. And as a result, the fact that we see them healing means that they didn't rely on predation because scavenging isn't as demanding. Mm -hmm. So even with all these injuries, they could manage to stumble over to some rotting carcass and feed on it. And therefore, all these injured Allosaurus, you could look at it either way, either supporting predation or supporting scavenging. The reason, though, I mentioned that 100 attacks, 1 in 40,000 would survive is because this counter paper said that lions attack, quote, at least 100 times a year, end quote. Oh, okay. So, quote, even at a very low rate of five attacks per year and only a 1% chance of attacks leading to death, an Allosaurus would have a 78% chance of dying at the hands of a prey animal it attacked by its 30th birthday, end quote. Ooh. Which is still a very, very high death rate for animals. Because we do know lions sometimes get killed by the things that they attack, but it's very, very rare. Mm-hmm especially relative to the number of attacks that they do, let alone like the lifespan of a lion. Right. So yeah, I think I agree with these authors that if they were going to attack something, they probably wouldn't attack something that gave them a 10% chance of getting killed. Another piece that the responders focused on was that the predators had higher metabolic rates than the scavengers in the model, meaning the predatory allosaurs versus the scavenging allosaurs. In the code, the model shows that the predators had a 50% higher metabolism than scavengers, and it's not actually described in the first paper. It only mentions the needing 11 kilograms of meat a day up to a different number depending on their metabolism. Mm -hmm. But based on this 50% extra requirement for the predators, that means that the scavenger either needed only half of the meat, <laughs> mm -hmm. basically, or the predator needed to find 50% more meat 
in order to survive, which is a huge disadvantage for the predator in this model, obviously. Yeah, they're burning a lot of calories hunting prey. Yeah. Funnily enough, the opposite logic has been used to negate the possibility of T-Rex as a scavenger, basically saying they would have spent so much energy looking for carry-on, like wandering around basically, that they would have burned a ton of calories just moving around. Hmm. And the authors of the response think that if anything, the scavenger should be burning more calories. Because they're moving around so much. Yeah. And even though hunts do require moving very fast and running quickly and sometimes for a decent amount of time, you know, it could be 10, 20, 30 minutes. In terms of the overall amount of energy that predators expend, it actually isn't that much of their daily. If you think about like a human and our 2000 calorie a day diet, if we run for an hour in that day, we might use three or 400 calories. It's not a huge component of our daily caloric needs. Mm. They also highlighted another thing which I touched on in early episodes, and that's that the sauropod meat lasted way too long in the model. So I use this as a fun fact, saying that vultures like to wait a couple days for food to decay, but they usually won't eat meat after about the fourth day. That's kind of like us and leftovers. Yeah, exactly. Except this is like rotting, getting really disgusting. And no fridge. (laughs) Yeah, no refrigeration. (laughs) (laughs) No cooking either. I've found some examples, though, of vultures going up to a couple weeks, but in this model, the amount of good meat does drop over time, but it's still pretty optimistic. So after 20 days, 90% of the calories are still available, Mm -hmm. which is going on three weeks of rotting meat out in the open, no refrigeration, lots of other animals around, maggots, all that kind of stuff. After 40 days, 20% is still available. And after 90 days, 15% is available compared to a fresh sauropod. Hmm. The idea to me that after 90 days, any of it is still edible seems a little bit crazy. And even though 15% doesn't sound like that much, for example, taking their 45-ton Brachiosaurus as Mm -hmm. an example, that would still be equivalent to a 7-ton animal or, again, about the same size as a male African elephant. (laughs) It's a lot of meat. (laughs) It is a lot of meat. So a scavenging Allosaurus in their model has a very easy time finding food because... Because it's not picky. And because you can encounter the sauropod three months later Mm -hmm. and still get good meat off of it. Oh, I was thinking because it's not picky about the rotting meat. Yeah, that's true. Speaking of elephants... They are usually basically abandoned after 14 days due to the fouling of the meat. And so by a couple weeks later, if we're looking at what we think happens, it would be totally gross Mm. (laughs) and nothing would be going for it. The response does say that they agree that, quote, theropods typically the size of Allosaurus may have been relatively efficient facultative scavengers, end quote. So when they needed to, they scavenge. The key word there, yeah, is facultative. That's not really needed to. That's more like if the opportunity arose, Mm. they would scavenge. But they also say that the benefits of hunting young and or weak prey means that they definitely would have hunted as well. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have been obligate scavengers like a vulture. This is partly because of an important distinction from the vulture comparison. So vultures evolved to be less capable predators in order to be better scavengers. Essentially, you can think of it as if they evolved from something like a hawk, instead they evolved to be better at soaring, they're not as good at quick movements, they're better at covering a lot more distance, and they lost some of the abilities in their head and neck and like you were talking about feet Mm -hmm. for grabbing prey and all that kind of stuff. Just goes back to what your lifestyle is and then where your strengths are there. Exactly. So in the case of vultures, because they're flying, they had to make these trade-offs so that they could cover long distances soaring through the air. But other researchers have pointed out that land animals generally don't have to make those trade-offs. So Allosaurus, which is a land vertebrate, was probably not a pure scavenger because it didn't you know, evolve a different type of wing or anything like that to fly farther, it would have still had a similar head, similar teeth, similar legs, all that kind of stuff to a predator as a scavenger. And that's what we see in just living land vertebrates that scavenge. They also hunt because they have bodies that are good for both. So I'm going to get into the response to the response in just a moment. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. So the response to the response (laughs) about Allosaurus as a scavenger, 
they say that the stegosaurus plate bite was too shallow and not healed, so it's actually evidence of scavenging on the skin covering of the plate and not evidence of an attack. Oh, interesting. I was thinking it's hard to know with a bite what happened there. Yes. Certainly if there's no healing, you can't say one way or another whether it was scavenged or if it was preyed on. Mm -hmm. They also said that the case of the stegosaurus that apparently killed an attacking allosaurus is evidence for their high mortality estimate for the hunting allosaurus being accurate. Yeah, although they were saying it was sauropods that would kill them. (laughs) Yeah. But there were other animals there, like stegosaurus. It does kind of support their claim that allosaurus wasn't great at hunting. Mm. I will say, though, that it does not support their claim that allosaurus mostly scavenged, though, because that's clearly evidence of it going after an alive stegosaurus, although they frame it in terms of, well, that allosaurus was desperate, and that's why it was hunting instead of scavenging. Or was the stegosaurus rabid? (laughs) Attacking everything. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. No. It could get away from a stegosaurus. (laughs) Oh, that's true. (laughs) I just like the idea of an herbivorous dinosaur just being tired of it all and going after some predator. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it could happen. But in this case, it's more likely that it was either an allosaurus that was often going after stegosaurus or it was an unlikely event. And that's why it died because it shouldn't have messed with the stegosaurus. Mm. At the very least, though, Allosaurus certainly hunted some of the time because we have evidence of this, at least with the stegosaur, if not also the other stegosaur with the plate. They acknowledge that smaller ornithischians likely would have been prey, but they say they didn't include them in the model because they mostly wanted to see if Allosaurus could survive only on carrion of sauropods. Yeah, and that's what you do with these models is you test out different scenarios and see what shakes out. Yeah, but obviously it tilted the balance towards scavenging over hunting because they did make those comparisons. Mm. So without the smaller, easier to hunt stuff, it makes it harder for Allosaurus to hunt. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair point. Similar to our interview, they argued that Allosaurus was mostly a scavenger, even if it hunted sometimes. It's sort of like that semi-aquatic thing where it's like, well, is it a scavenger? Is it a semi-scavenger? Is it a facultative scavenger? Is it a obligate scavenger? Mm. All those sorts of nuance. Where on the spectrum is it? Yeah. Of scavenging. Exactly. So they're saying they think it was mostly a scavenger, whereas the counter paper was saying it probably wasn't much of a scavenger at all. Although most people will say a carnivore will scavenge when it can. Mm -hmm. They hinted at an upcoming paper that doesn't include the high probability of being killed while hunting, which was one of the big issues. And they said that the 50% metabolic penalty was a misinterpretation of the extra cost of failed hunts. Although again, like the response paper said, that failed hunt thing probably wouldn't have impacted their overall daily intake of food requirement that much and it does seem like a scavenger would have to cover more ground than an ambush predator so i'm not totally sure about that point they also doubled down on the carry-on availability basically saying that even if the meat rotted faster they underestimated the number of sauropods so there still would have been a ton of meat around Mm. so it's like well maybe it didn't last 90 days but there were 10 times as many sauropods so even if it only lasts 10 days then it all evens out anyway right Well, not necessarily 10 times, but yeah, some amount of more sauropods. Yeah. Well, I guess it would be nine times if it decayed in 10 days versus Mm -hmm. 90 days. But they didn't specifically say that, right? I think they said that there was about 30 times as many sauropods, so it would have been even more meat than the 90-day number. Okay. There are other arguments from both sides, but I think those are the main points that were thrown around. And the original authors are still adamant that Allosaurus relied on sauropods for scavenging. Mm. I really love this topic. I think sauropod carcasses would have been unlike any modern carry-on in scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were talking about an elephant is just a fraction of the amount of a sauropod. Yeah. And something must have eaten them. I think that Allosaurus are as likely as any other carnivore. Yeah. The question really is just how much Allosaurus relied on them versus prey that they hunted. Yeah, it's a really interesting theory. I'm glad people are exploring it. Yeah, me too. 
Certainly a lot more plausible than T. rex being a scavenger since it didn't live around any sauropods, weighed way more, and clearly had a lot of adaptations that made it good at hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got one last news item. Thank you to L. Rex who shared this one with us on our Patreon and Discord. There's a cool trailer for Talon, which is about a Dakota Raptor with magical powers. <laughs> if Dakota Raptor wasn't controversial enough as a possible mosaic yeah. fossil, now it has magical powers. Oh, it's it's really cute. The animation style reminds me of the Dragon Prince and Avatar The Last Airbender, which when I looked that up, they were both those shows were made by the same people, so that makes sense. They have a similar style. Talon is created by Heather Para. And in this trailer, you see a young Dakota raptor with magical powers goes on a quest with a wizard to find other magical dinosaurs so they can all master their powers and save the universe. <laughs> and the Dakota raptor also tragically loses their mom. No. But it's cool. It's exploring what could have caused the mass extinctions in this, uh, I'm going to say, a, a fantasy world because they've got magical powers. The description yep. says that it starts with the great dying at the end of the Permian and ends with the asteroid in the late Cretaceous. That's covering a lot of ground. And Dakota Raptor's around for all of it? I'm guessing the magical powers plays a part here. Okay, like it's time traveling or something? Something. Or maybe they live really long, I don't know. Hmm. But it looks fun. It looks like it could be bingeable. The dinosaurs are pretty cute. I think it's just a teaser or a trailer for now, though. Cool. As promised, we have a dinosaur connection challenge. And for this episode, we're we talking about hockey. Thank you, Sue, for suggesting this one. I'm going to focus on ice hockey. And I'm going to start with maybe the obvious connection, which is mascots. <laughs> yeah. There's leagues all over the world. When I was looking for this, I was only able to find a list of dinosaur mascots in North America. So I it's possible I have missed some mascots around the world that are dinosaurs or dinosaur-related birds. <laughs> I'll start with the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. They have the Calgary Dinos. Ah, that's pretty direct. Yeah, that's <laughs> all their athletic teams, including ice hockey, field hockey, baseball, basketball, soccer, and more. It's for their men and women teams. And the logo looks like a red T-Rex with a gold underbelly because their colors are red and gold. Hmm. Then there is the National Hockey League mascots, the NHL. There were no non-avian dinosaurs, but there were a lot of birds. So we've got Iceberg the Penguin for the Pittsburgh Penguins, <sighs> and it's meant to be a king penguin. <laughs> There's Slapshot, the large bald eagle mascot for the Washington Capitals. Tommy Hawk for the Chicago Blackhawks. It's got four feathers on its head. Then there's the former mascots, starting with Pete the Penguin, for the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's an actual penguin from Ecuador that was on loan <sighs> from the Pittsburgh Zoo, and Pete was the mascot in 1968. Unfortunately, Pete died of pneumonia one month into the season, and it's possible Pete died due to the ice crew at the arena keeping his nest area too warm. Oh, no. Yeah. You don't hear of things dying of pneumonia from being too warm. No. But I guess if you're a penguin, too warm is more dangerous than too cold. I guess so. The team also had a second penguin for the 1971 to 1972 season. And then they replaced it with a dude in a suit. Yeah. I don't know when exactly that happened. Then there's the former mascot, the Red Winger, for the Detroit Red Wings. It looked like a red bird, and it was the mascot from 1982 <laughs> to 1987. Just a, just a red bird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a cardinal? More generic? I guess it's a person in a bird suit, so it's hard to say. <laughs> okay. There's also the former mascot Thrash for the Atlanta Thrashers, and that is a six foot three Georgia Brown Thrasher who was the mascot from 1999 to 2011. So, again, somebody in a suit. Much more specific, though. Yes. And last but not least, there's Wild Wing, the anthropomorphic duck for the Anaheim Ducks, who also appears in the Mighty Ducks animated series, which brings me to my next subtopic. <laughs> that was the first one I thought of when I thought of hockey and birds. I yeah. thought of the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> that was what led me to mascots. Yeah, to look those up. So the Mighty Ducks, 
in addition to having those movies, there is an animated series, a TV series, that ran in 1996. There's only one season. It's loosely inspired by the films and the Anaheim Ducks team, that NHL team. In the Mighty Ducks, the animated series, episode 13 is called Jurassic Puck. <laughs> and it's dinosaurs attacking dinosaurs because the team, they're all ducks. So you got the non-avian dinosaurs attacking the avian dinosaurs. Did they acknowledge in the show anywhere that the Mighty Ducks are themselves dinosaurs? No. Oh, missed opportunity. That is a missed opportunity, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in this episode, you've got... Dragonis, an evil dragon-like character who can breathe fire, he wants to rule the world. And he brings dinosaurs to life from a test tube. Makes sense. Jurassic <sighs> Puck, Jurassic Park. The, yep. the goal is to destroy Anaheim, California, where the team is based, and the Mighty Ducks. I love that, like, if you're an evil villain bent on world domination, you start with Anaheim. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> you go where the hockey is. <laughs> So in the beginning of the episode, the Mighty Ducks, they win a hockey game, and then they get an alert that dinosaurs are attacking. And these dinosaurs are keeping the ducks occupied while the bad guys set up a missile to launch into the earth and release this volcano and lava in the middle of downtown Anaheim, as they put it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yep. Now, the dinosaurs, to the good stuff in the episode, there's two Tyrannosaurus, one Seismosaurus, two Triceratops, and then for good measure, you've got the non-dinosaur Pteranodon. Do they call the Pteranodon a dinosaur over and over again? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was mostly paying attention to the dinosaurs. The Pteranodon does take one of the ducks and flies away with him. One of the ducks does call it the Pteranodon prehistoric poultry. Mm -hmm. As opposed to them, which are modern poultry. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> point. <laughs> Now, the two Tyrannosaurs in the episode, they walk a little bit like in that tripod posture. Oh, and this is after Jurassic Park came out by a few years, and they're even referencing Jurassic Park, and they mm. still have the T-Rex and the goofy pose. A little bit. That's a bummer. But they can jump and smash vehicles. At least some of the time the hands were pronated, they were often seen clapping, not slapping, but not always. Okay. So they did the hands right most of the time, not being pronated? I think so, yeah. Okay. When I first was looking at them, I noticed that they looked right. And then later on, I noticed they were not doing that anymore. And then, yeah. But I think for the most part, it was not pronated. The arms, though, they were a little bit too long and they're pretty skinny. I think that was common for cartoons for a while, with T-Rex anyway. Yeah. I mean, it had very small arms, so yeah. they look kind of funny if you draw them accurately. <laughs> <laughs> and the Seismosaurus smashes buildings and piles rubble on some of the ducks. It's a little bit too bulky. The tail's not quite long enough, and of course it looks cartoony. But it is cool that they chose Seismosaurus because you don't see that in the media too much. Yeah, I wonder if it's because it was one of the more recent large sauropods mm, around that time. Could be. There were some fun quotes around the seismosaur, like, quote, when I saw that seismosaur, I froze. Why? I have an irrational fear of 40,000 ton lizards, okay? 40,000 tons? <laughs> Do they mean 40 tons? Do they mix up their 40,000 pounds and 40 tons? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm misquoting. Hopefully not. The seismosaur is, is much larger than everyone else. I think they did a good job with the scale there in terms of the seismosaurus and the other dinosaurs and the ducks. It can pick things up with its mouth, kind of like Gertie, and move things for the bad guys. Then there's the two triceratops. They ram into buildings and vehicles while roaring. In terms of how they look, they might be the most accurate looking. They also have the most details on them, maybe because they're the most well-known of the group, so it's easier to draw those details. They even included the jugal horns on the, on the cheeks or the side of the face. Yeah. Yeah, that detail gets missed a lot. Yeah. And the Triceratops, they one of them gets its nose horn stuck in a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote around them. Quote, don't those Jurassic jerks ever take a nap? <laughs> Weird. Yeah. Anyway, Seismosaurus, Triceratops, and Pteranodon, they all work together near the end of the episode to fight against the ducks. But, of course, the ducks save the day. And then they turn on the TV to see a show called Ancient Predators Myth or Legend. 
which was <laughs> a Tyrannosaurus. And they all walk away or turn off the TV because they've had enough dinos for that day. That's funny because it's like if you had a hypothetical question, you've got a Triceratops, a Pteranodon, and a Seismosaurus mm -hmm. against a group of ducks. Yeah. Like five ducks. Which one wins? That reminds me of <laughs> that. Was it a simulation or a game where it was a Tyrannosaurus against 10,000 chickens? Yes. Yeah. But this is just five ducks, right? Well, yeah, but they also have <laughs> weapons. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> ducks with the laser beams and rocket launchers. <laughs> <laughs> Back to ice hockey. Ice hockey, of course, is a full contact sport and it's fast paced. People can move up to 20 to 30 miles per hour or 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Not me. I'm not that good of an ice skater. Yeah, I max out at about two miles an hour, I think. <laughs> I can go faster than you, but not well, by much. I have to I have to cling to the wall the whole time. So <laughs> it really slows me down. And there's a lot of checking in hockey. So for example, there's the hip check when you drop to a near crouching stance and then you swing your hips towards another player to get them off balance. There's shoulder checking when you shoulder them to muscle them out of position, but you keep your elbow tucked in. There's poke checking too when you use your stick to poke the puck away from another player and that's just a few of the different ways you can check all of this contact can sometimes lead to injuries so there's common hockey injuries according to the university of pittsburgh medical center ucmp they include shoulder injuries like shoulder separation or shoulder dislocation knee injuries broken collarbones concussions and muscle strains also, overuse injuries, when you overuse your muscles, for example. I bring this up because there are a lot of pathologies and injuries that have been found in dinosaurs. So I want to focus on injuries that dinosaurs and hockey players may have in common. Mm. That is not where I expected you to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't where I expected to go either, but it kind of came to me while I was watching that Mighty Ducks episode. <laughs> <laughs> watching them all not get injured. <laughs> well, that's true. Or, you know, only temporarily injured. Now, in terms of dinosaur pathologies, at least for ones that are injury related, there have been many, many Pachyrhinosaurus, the Ceratopsian specimens found with broken or fractured ribs that were sometimes healed, not always, shoulder injuries, broken legs, and stress fractures in the phalanges, either in the hands or the feet. Those stress fractures are tiny cracks in the bone, often caused by repetitive force, like jumping up and down a lot or running long distances. So those are things that can happen to, say, hockey players, too. There's also a pachyrhinosaur specimen found with rounded growths projecting from the underside of its squamosal bone on the head, possibly from an avulsion injury. So a piece of bone attached to a ligament or tendon breaks away from the main part of the bone. This happens a lot with human athletes too. It could happen when sprinting or hitting or sliding, as examples. And another specimen was found that broke part of its frill and lost one of its spikes. The frill healed, but it was asymmetric. That happens to hockey players too. <laughs> with the frills <laughs> and the spikes, yeah. Uh, but you could break something and then it could heal funny. Oh, that's true. That's why you need a good medical team. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of other pathologies have been found in other dinosaurs. Uh, just rounding out the list, a few more that are from stress or broken bones include a centrosaurus that broke its lower leg and then it healed to form a false joint. Oof. Yeah. There's a chimerosaurus with a spur-like lesion on its right arm, probably from a stress injury or repeatedly overexerting its muscles. And Tyrannosaurus specimens that have been found with fractured ribs, stress fractures on toe bones, and avulsion injuries. Sue the T-Rex has one on the right humerus, the arm bone. I feel like there might be a T-Rex, maybe it's a different theropod that has a broken collarbone too. I tried to find that one, and maybe we've talked about it before, but I, I couldn't find it again. Yeah. So if anyone knows... <laughs> you can fill us in. And then, of course, there's the multiple Allosaurus specimens found with fractured ribs, bringing it back to Allosaurus here. As I mentioned before, well, in a recent episode, there's the one that was found 
with 10 pathologies, and some of them were from trauma. There was also an ornithomimus, where we talked in the last episode, with the blunt force trauma to its foot and that butterfly fragment fracture pattern. Yeah, hopefully that doesn't happen to anybody playing hockey. That sounds horrible. Yeah, it does. It does. But that <laughs> that type of fracture happens enough that it's got a name, butterfly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, dinosaurs can get injured. Hockey players can get injured. I think that's my main connection. Well, no, the Mighty Ducks is probably my main connection there. <laughs> the Mighty Ducks fought dinosaurs. Yeah. In Jurassic Puck. Yeah. <laughs> episode 13 of the animated series. <laughs> if you want some real dino nerd street cred, there's your little factoid. <laughs> yes. And in just a moment, we'll get on to our Dinosaur of the Day Duryavenator. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Duria Venador, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a basal megalosaurid theropod that lived in the Middle Jurassic in what is now England in the Oolite Formation. We briefly mentioned this dinosaur in episode 47 when we covered Megalosaurus. As a reminder, Megalosaurus was a wastebasket taxon. David Norman in 1985 said that it was used as a quote-unquote dustbin. In other words, pretty much every theropod they found in England and the surrounding area for a while, they just threw in a megalosaurus. Yes, including Duria venator. <laughs> so Duria venator was considered to be medium-sized. It's estimated to be 16 to 23 feet or 5 to 7 meters long and weigh 2,200 pounds, about one ton. It probably looked similar to megalosaurus with an elongated head, a long tail, walking on two legs. As a megalosaurid, it probably had muscular arms to help catch and kill prey. And it had unique features in the jaw, including deep grooves. The vomer, which is part of the bone at the middle of the palate, was similar to Allosaurus. Allosaurus keeps coming up in this episode. <laughs> yeah. Daria venator had curved serrated teeth, and its teeth were different from megalosaurus, including in the way the front teeth of the lower jaw slanted forward. It had heterodon teeth, different teeth, and the teeth at the front of the lower jaw were longer than the teeth in the back. This may have helped Duria venator pluck and grasp when eating. There were also replacement teeth visible in the tooth sockets. The type species is Duria venator hesperis. The genus name means dorset hunter, and the species name means the west or western. The fossils were found in 1882 in Dorset, near Sherburn. Interesting. So. Duria is Dorset yeah. in Latin, I guess. I guess so. Huh. Richard Owen described the front third of the skull, including part of the upper jaw, the right maxilla, part of the bone at the middle of the palate, that vomer, both dentaries, the lower jaw, and other parts of the lower jaw and associated teeth. And he described that in 1883 as Megalosaurus bucklandi. The fossils are now at the Natural History Museum in London, which makes sense if Richard Owen was the one describing them originally. Yeah. The fossils were found by Edward Clemenshaw when, according to Richard Owen, quote, blocks of this stone were in course of preparation for a building when indications of embedded fossils being detected by Mr. Clemenshaw on fractured surfaces of the quarry stones, he withdrew all such from the building yard and transmitted them to the British Museum for identification, end quote. So they were working on a building, they found the fossils, and they stopped for a while to send the fossils to the museum. The exact spot where the fossils were found is unclear, though in 1916, Richardson wrote that, quote, the site of the quarry in which the remains were found is very near the back of the houses on the north side of Cold Harbor Road, end quote. Very descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> the back of the houses. Mm -hmm. Maybe there weren't that many houses on that road at that point. Maybe. <laughs> Now, as I said, Richard Owen thought these fossils were Megalosaurus bucklandi. Megalosaurus bucklandi, the skull was only known from fragments. Owen wrote that the differences between the fossils that Clemenshaw found and the Megalosaurus bucklandi were in the size of the jaw, but that the teeth were similar in size, form, and structure. So, quote, there was no ground for predicating distinction of species, end quote. Owen also thought that the large opening behind the maxilla was an eye socket. Now we know that to be the opening or fenestra in front of the eye socket. And based on this, he estimated the diameter of the eyeball to be two inches. 
which is smaller than it is, I think. Probably. Could be about right. I don't know. I don't think that's the right size since he was estimating it based on the opening in front of the eye socket. Yeah, unless he's right for the wrong reasons. Mm. <laughs> in 1926, Friedrich von Huhn based his skull reconstruction of Megasaurus Buckland eye on the Dorset specimen fossils. But he also said that many of the fossils assigned to Megalosaurus probably weren't Megalosaurus. So they, people were thinking that pretty early on. In 1964, Alec Walker found that the specimen from Dorset was older than Megalosaurus Buckland-I and, quote, at least specifically distinct from the latter. They also found small differences in the jaws and differences in the tooth sockets. In 1974, Michael Waldman redescribed the Dorset specimen and renamed it as Megalosaurus Hesperus. He found differences in the number of teeth and said that Megalosaurus hesperus had more teeth, but that he couldn't compare any further because there weren't enough fossils. He also found that the premaxilla was similar to Allosaurus, but found Megalosaurus hesperus and Allosaurus to be different due to the way the jaws curve and the position of the tooth carina, which relates to the cutting edge of the tooth. Yeah, it's basically the serrated side that goes into the meat. <laughs> to the meat. <laughs> now, multiple people questioned Megalosaurus Hesperus. Gregory Paul listed it as Megalosaurus question mark Hesperus, and Tom Holtz in 2000 referred to it as Megalosaurus in quotes Hesperus, just as some examples of people questioning it. Samuel Wells and Jaime Emilio Powell planned to rename Megalosaurus Hesperus as Walkersaurus. But then that wasn't published, so that name's considered to be nomum nudum. In 2004, Holtz and others also said that there was no diagnostic feature of Megalosaurus hesperus, though it could still be its own species. And Darren Nash and David Martill in 2007 found it to be a valid species, but probably wasn't Megalosaurus. Then in 2008, Roger Benson and others found that only the fragment of the jaw that was used to name Megalosaurus was definitely Megalosaurus bucklandi. Later, though, they did find a few more fossils also belong to Megalosaurus bucklandi, but not the Dorset specimen. And then later in 2008, Roger Benson redescribed Megalosaurus hesperus and found it to be different enough to rename it as Duria venator. So that's when the name came into being was 2008? Yes. So fairly recent. Uh, other animals that lived around the same time and place as Duria venator include the megalosaurid magnosaurus and sauropods, stegosaurs, ornithopods, and marine invertebrates. And our fun fact of the day is that if Allosaurus was a scavenger, it may have enabled smaller scavengers to feed after it. Interesting. So there's a great video on National Geographic showing what happens after an elephant dies. And even though vultures often spot dead animals right away, they often can't tear through the hide right away. So they have to just sort of wait at a distance for another animal to come and get the process started. And that was the case with this one specific case study of an elephant. Hmm. So it died. There are vultures nearby, but they're just chilling. A whole day passes. Nothing really happens. After the second day, a bunch of elephants arrive to examine the body. There's a whole thing about elephants mourning. It's very sad. Mm -hmm. Some of them climb on top of it. Others sort of back up towards it, touch it with their hind feet. Aww. It's very sweet. In this case study, though, the elephants sort of leave after the second day. And then a hyena shows up on the third day. And it makes the first tear through the skin, going for the tastiest meat first. Sort of goes for the stomach, basically. Mm-hmm. Lions also are known to be the first to break through the skin of an elephant. Hmm. Sometimes they're the first ones on the scene. Shortly after that, a very large group of vultures arrives to take advantage of that hole made by the hyena. And so they sort of just crowd it. It might even be like a hundred of them. There's so many vultures. <laughs> when the hyena wants more food, the vultures literally line up behind it and around it, just everywhere, just waiting for it to go. And then it's pretty orderly. They sort of all go in, take their turn, ripping out pieces. It's not super orderly, but it's not a completely insane feeding frenzy like you see with alligators or Komodo dragons or Some something. Some kind of hierarchy. Yeah, and like a little bit of, you know, because they have to digest and like eat the meat. So as they're doing that, they kind of step away. Eat <laughs> the meat. Yeah. <laughs> in this case, a leopard arrived on day four, 
but it just sort of looked at it and then decided that it didn't want to eat any of it. Hmm. So not all carnivores are equally excited by carrion. And that is a big piece that we can't figure out by looking at the fossil record. By day five, there are hundreds of vultures, literally hundreds, Mm -hmm. so many vultures. And these hundreds of vultures just tear this thing to pieces and just consuming most of it. Although there are hyenas in the mix too. They're basically taking turns largely with the vultures consuming the elephant during the daytime and the hyenas there at night because the hyenas are mostly nocturnal, I guess. Although there are some hyenas there in the daytime and then they sort of take turns with the vultures. Something similar may have happened with sauropods. We just don't know which animals would have been the first to arrive and which ones would have come later. It's possible that Allosaurus was the hyena or lion of this equation tearing in first, and then maybe some smaller theropod like Ornitholestes or some other small theropod arrived later, like the vultures. Now that there's a big hole opened up in the sauropod, they can get in and get to the tasty meat. But the details of which dinosaurs would have preferred to eat the carrion really comes down to their guts and whether or not their guts could handle eating carrion. Mm -hmm. So like that leopard that showed up and looked at it at day four and was like, that's a little too rotten for me, presumably, (laughs) and moved along. Whereas the hyena is well equipped to deal with this nasty starting to rot meat. We just can't tell that from the fossil record yet. We haven't figured out how to determine what sort of intensity the guts could handle in terms of rotting meat. But hopefully in the future we will, and we might be able to figure out which dinosaurs were the scavengers. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Until then, we're just sort of stuck with guessing and arguing over how much of a predator would Allosaurus have been based on its skull musculature and things like that, which are a lot harder to discern from. I'd say that's how it is with a lot of our guesses around dinosaur behavior. That's true. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you want easy access to links in our show notes, sign up for our newsletter at inodino.com. Stay tuned for next week's episode where we talk with John Holmes about how he recently recreated J.R.R. Tolkien's 1938 presentation on dragons. Yeah, it's a fantastic interview. I highly recommend coming back next week. Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.